Hey everyone, uh, thank you for joining me. I'm, I'm uh, not truly at Grady, but I, I always feel like I am. Um, but thanks again for joining us tonight in this virtual town hall. It's always good to be with you and I appreciate your, your time to spend with us. I just remember that, you know, whatever I say, I, I, I try to keep it general and you should always follow up with your medical team for individual advice. So these are the numbers from uh, recently throughout the world. And, and what's really notable is just how quickly India has uh, catapulted up. The US used to be so far ahead of every other country in terms of total infections, but you can see the gap closing. Nevertheless, the numbers are still astounding. And in terms of USA, India, and Brazil, uh, now with Russia, we're talking a million, multi-millions of cases in each of those countries. And the deaths obviously are associated with that. Here's the latest map of hotspots throughout the world. And the US continues to be amongst the highest in terms of new cases. And we have to keep that in mind, even though we're having generally good news, as I'll talk about in a minute. Really lots of activity continues to occur throughout South America and Central America. And then the, the big news continues to be how cases are, are really popping up throughout Europe, causing certain governments to lock down in certain places and a lot of disruptions, obviously. <clears throat> and so one of the, the take home message, messages to continue to keep throughout this talk is as we talk about how places do well at times and do poorly at times, it can be very cyclical as a respiratory virus like the flu um, is known to be. And so with the coronavirus being so contagious, we're seeing places where in Europe, they locked down very quickly, uh, they went through a lot of pain, but they, they benefited from that. And then you can see how quickly things uh, came back. And so that's a lesson for all of us. And especially in the US you, and, and where we are um, in the Southeast, there was one point when most of the really dark red was uh, always uh, in the Southeast. And you can continue to see, if you look back and take a step back through the entire country, you continue to see a lot of colors in, in the predominantly Southeast region. So there's still a lot of cases, but relative to where we were, you can see that the really dark colors are shifting up towards the Tennessee Valley through the middle Mississippi, and then especially in the upper Midwest where Wisconsin's having a terrible go of it, but a lot of the other areas like Minnesota, South Dakota, North Dakota, and even though it doesn't look like it, Montana is having a lot of spots where they normally wouldn't. And you know, these, th these are very relatively rural areas or less dense. And so these dark regions tend to be more of an impact, um, relatively speaking. <clears throat> so in, in the US, you know, we, we have con gone, gone down in terms of the number of cases. And what you are seeing is sort of the rebound and we're getting a sense that it's starting to tick up again. The deaths always lag, as we mentioned, and it has a lot to do with the, the, um, the demographics of the people getting the cases. So as we had a lot of young people originally, we didn't have as many deaths, but there's certainly spillover into other groups. And so it's left to be seen as to what this increase in new cases will have in terms of deaths. Now in Georgia, um, we're doing better. And it's something that we need to be proud of. Um, and I'm, I'm very happy about that. And I know a lot of people are still, we're not out of the woods. You still see a lot of orange and darker orange colors. But again, relative where we used to be when the entire map was completely dark red, uh, we're certainly better. And you can see the areas that continue to light up. 
which are areas that were problems before, but hopefully they're continuing to improve as well. And the new reported cases in Georgia continue to go down. You kind of get a sense maybe whether it's flattening here and we'll have to keep an eye on that, whether we reflect what's going on throughout the US. And again, there's nothing permanent about these borders between states. And the reality is that the states around us continue to have a lot of cases. So we'll have to see as we go into the rest of the fall and the winter. We never really got down dramatically in terms of the deaths where we were in the middle of the, uh, the summer. And again, you can kind of see it maybe creeping up. So again, a lot of good news, um, but the lessons of Europe and a lot of other places we have to keep in mind as we go forward. Continuing on the good news trail in Georgia anyway, you see the hospitalization rates have come down dramatically since the summer. Uh, and even though it's looking like it's leveling off in terms of how the, the hospitals are capable of taking in new patients, that capacity um, remains to be open. So that's good. We're able to continue to take in people. There's rooms room in the ICU, and we want to keep it that way. So that's my brief review of the world, uh, the US and Georgia in terms of the overall activity. What I started the last time was present um, some updated um, scientific information that's been published in areas of interest for us. And last time I presented on some recent studies that address this question. Are people on immunosuppressive drugs at significantly higher risk of being infected by COVID? And basically the summary, and you can go back and look at the video on the LFA site. Um, thank you, Terry, for helping us with that. Uh, and the conclusion was basically in almost all studies, the uh, infection rate in immunosuppressed individuals um, was essentially similar to the general population. Again, you know, the people that are immunosuppressed, not unlike many of you, are just going to be much more heightened in terms of awareness and compliance to masking and social distancing. But nevertheless, uh, one fear that was out there anyway was perhaps since people um, were immunosuppressed with these conditions, that these infections would be so much more easier to get despite those, um, um, those actions or precautions anyway, but that has not been the case. <clears throat> so it looks like the risk of getting COVID exposures was not necessarily from being immunocompromised in any individual on immunosuppressive medications, but it was really more because of the general risk and activities that the population around us has been doing. If you're not having social distancing or masking um, or washing your hands. So that just underscores what we all should be doing and continuing to be doing, whether you're immunosuppressed or not, whether you have lupus or not. But it's good to know, anyway, the early signs is that there isn't a huge number of people, more so than the general population, um, with lupus and other um, conditions that require chronic immunosuppression. So this, uh, this week, I'll talk about a couple studies that, uh, in, in the context of this particular question. And, you know, what happens to those who are immunosuppressed with COVID infection? So let's say you, you are someone you, with lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or another chronic condition that requires medications that suppress your immune system and you are unfortunate enough to get the COVID infection. This is a study out of the um, scientific journal called Nature. And it looked at the, uh, it, it was published uh, around the summertime. <clears throat> and the authors here looked at um, electronic health record data from the United Kingdom. And this is over 17 million individuals 
and you know they have a centralized medical system there and, and so you can get a lot of a lot more information in an easier fashion in a country like Britain than it is the US where there's a lot of um, systems that no, don't necessarily talk to each other or at least very easily. So <clears throat> essentially we're able to get large numbers of individuals and cases and they looked at hospitalizations and specifically at people who died. They were so sick in the hospital and they died in the hospital. <clears throat> so they looked at individuals in terms of their risks of getting COVID and being hospitalized and then passing away in the hospital. And here, um, if you ever do go to the, the website and you look at the details of the journal, this is one way we can look at information. Um, the hazard ratio is basically the risk and a hazard ratio of one means that you don't have um, any greater risk of that particular outcome, in this case, death in a hospital. So every um, risk factor here that you see on the left that is on the line or on the left of the line, you have as great a risk or less of a risk than the general population in terms of dying in the hospital. <clears throat> and then with COVID. And on the right is when you have greater risk, especially if the, the bars on either side of the dot, which represents confidence intervals, it's statistically kind of the area of range that we're confident in saying that this dot represents. But if the dot and the bar are completely towards the right of the one, that there's an increased risk statistically. And the further right you are away, the stronger that risk is. So something like great um, risk factor being of, of dying in the hospital from COVID is age, older age, especially much older age. So if you're 80 plus, you're much over to the right here and you have an increased, uh, increased, much increased risk of dying in the hospital from COVID. And then as you, as the ages go down, <clears throat> the risk goes down. Males are also at, at greater risk compared to females. Um, and then levels of obesity, the more obese you are, and you've been, you've been hearing about this in the news in general. So obesity, uh, greater obesity is at higher risk of dying in the hospital from COVID. If you're a former smoker, it's interestingly um, more so than current smoking. Probably represents people that have been smoking a long time, whereas you know you may be smoking currently, but maybe not as long is my guess. But and then um, if you're of non-white race, uh, all of the ones here in terms of South Asian, Black, and other uh, increased risk. So that this is a phenomenon that is worldwide and not just the U.S. And if you're more socially deprived, and they had a score in terms of how socially deprived you may be, that increases your risk of dying in the hospital from COVID. If you have diabetes, recent cancer, reduced kidney function, chronic lung or liver disease, those were comorbidities that came out of this study as an increased risk of dying in the hospital from COVID. Now, um, they did have a look at lupus in the context they lumped it with rheumatoid arthritis and psor psoriasis. I'm sorry, I put psoriatic arthritis, but they just put psoriasis here. And you can see it is towards the right, um, but it, you know, it's, it's not very strongly to the right. So uh, they had 885,000 people in this group, and certainly there was an increased risk of uh, a bad outcome like death in the hospital, um, roughly about 23% higher, anywhere from 12 to 35% is sort of the confidence interval range, but not as dramatic as some of the other conditions. You know, for example, having a malignancy or obesity, um, being socially deprived, uh, those are much higher risk than um, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and psoriasis. And then when they looked at other immunosuppressive conditions, they were um, higher than the group with rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. So there's a couple of studies out of New York City and Boston. Um, the one out of New York here on the left, they looked, uh, they've had 86 people early in the pandemic when they were hit very hard. They found 
uh, they described 86 people with autoimmune diseases with COVID. And the rate at which they, that group was hospitalized was very similar to that of the general population with only one person passing away in the autoimmune group. So at least the early signal from New York early in the pandemic didn't show tremendously poor outcomes. And in Boston on the right, they compared um, rheumatic disease patients with 104 people without rheumatic disease that were very similar in terms of race, gender, age, and other factors, what we call a control group. And mortality um, from COVID was similar in both. Hospitalizations were similar in both. Uh, the rheumatic disease group required a bit more intensive care admission and mechanical ventilation, although it did not end up in death. But uh, um, having more numbers and more time would increase our confidence that this is a true finding as well. So all of these things are, are relatively early, but they do seem to, if you put them all together, give us a general idea of at least our early observations, and that is the risk of severe outcomes in people with rheumatic diseases that get COVID and are hospitalized seem to be similar to the general population around them at least so far with a few studies that have been done. None of the studies have only looked at um, people with lupus, and none of the studies have been done specifically in our part of the US. So how they apply directly to, to us in our population is not quite known, but generally speaking, it's, it has been reassuring to some extent in that our initial fears that people with lupus, especially given the type of immune condition, the medications that we're on, um, at least we're not seeing a huge disproportionate number of cases of COVID, as well as those who get COVID having um, poorer outcomes to a much greater effect than the general population who get COVID. And that's led to the American College of Rheumatology and the European Alliance Against Rheumatism uh, league Against Rheumatism called ULAR. It's basically the American equivalent in Europe. These two organizations that are very um, key and have leadership roles in the, in the field of rheumatology and the care of rheumatology, and they came out with statements that mirror each other in that immunosuppressive medications should not, um, I'm sorry, should be continued in non-infected individuals. Um, I mean, I think many of you and others had the appropriate question early in the pandemic you know, should I stop some of these medications that suppress my immune system with this bad illness that's going around, this bad infection? And clearly the guidance is no, um, you should not. Because the outcomes, the risk of getting the disease or COVID has not been dramatically different. And what we'll find out next time is I'll go over some studies regarding the outcomes of uh, individuals with COVID on certain medications. So we'll talk about you know, um, steroids, prednisone, and other medications that are not uncommon in terms of their use in lupus. So we're getting, boy, we had a lot of news recently regarding treatments, haven't we? And obviously the president has put first uh, and foremost, a few things in terms of the press and um, public discussion. And that sparked, I think, a few questions this week. So I'll start with this one. Is there really any cure-all treatment that has recently been touted? For example, Regeneron is the company that makes a drug called Remdesivir, which is what's uh, listed here. And that is a, um, it seems all the rage and being promoted for eventual emergency use authorization by the FDA. And uh, at least some of the early data has been in smaller numbers of patients and they claim to be it's really safe and potentially helpful. Um, so what remdesivir is, is a bunch of antibodies basically that are made. So when you get an infection, you make antibodies and the antibodies help fight the infection. And if you have persistent antibodies, or the ability to mount a quick antibody response. Your body can get trained to do these things, and that's the point behind immunizations. 
then future infections, uh, you could either avoid a full infection or um, have a much less severe course. So this is giving a bunch of antibodies to individuals, and um, this is the, the treatment. Um, it's an IV, and um, this was just published a few days ago or several days ago, and uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, what they did was it's a, it's a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trial, meaning nobody knew in terms of the investigators and the patients themselves uh, whether they're getting the IV remdesivir or placebo, just saline water, I bet. And um, the people that were recruited for the study were those who were hospitalized with COVID with evidence of lower respiratory tract infection. So these are relatively sick people because number one, they're in the hospital, but specifically they're having symptoms related to their pulmonary status. And they were randomly assigned to um, remdesivir or placebo up to 10 days. And the primary outcome with the main thing that this study is designed to address, the question was time to recovery. And recovery was defined by either being discharged from the hospital, um, or um, being um, discharged from the hospitalization for infection control purposes only. So these are basically people who get well enough to no longer be in the hospital. And the conclusion was here, it's that remdesivir was superior to placebo in shortening the time to recovery in adults who were hospitalized with COVID and had evidence of lower respiratory tract infection. Um, they had significant numbers of people. So this is much greater than the, the question that was posed. So this is the uh, one of the quote unquote definitive studies, or at least the first one, they may have other ones out there, um, but this is over a thousand people total. Um, so you can see 541 who got remdesivir, 521 who got placebo. And because these are people who are randomized, most of things by chance will equal out between groups. And you can pretty much see it happening across all these different characteristics in terms of the age, the sex distribution, the racial groups, you can see um, that none of these things differed dramatically between the remdesivir and the placebo groups. And you go down into the coexisting conditions and the um, severity of the, the symptoms that the people had. So this is important. And this is why randomi randomization is so key um, in these types of studies, and we keep saying that this is the, the gold standard, what we really look for in terms of these studies is because when randomization is done well and people have no opportunity to influence this, that is, they're blinded to which group people are put in, computers just flipping coins to um, randomly assess, you will get over a certain number of people um, an even distribution of all of these things so that the only thing that's different, not the only thing, but it, we think it's, it's the, the most um, impactful thing, because there may be stuff that we just don't measure, but really the main thing that's changing between these two groups is what they're getting, either remdesivir or placebo. So whatever happens at the end, the outcome, here in this case, being improved and being discharged from the hospital, whatever differences in outcome can be attributed to whether they got the remdesivir or the, or the placebo and not to the fact that one doctor likes remdesivir or believes in it or a patient does or one person is in this hospital and not that hospital. Randomization does the even distribution so that whatever results occur, we know we have a good idea that it's either the drug or not the drug. And I just took a couple um, figures from the study that's published, and you can see here that, uh, let me start here on the left. Um, these are people who, I forgot, um, this is overall, um, yeah, so these are people who, <clears throat> who met the primary outcome, who left the hospital uh, with, much improved pulmonary symptoms with COVID. 
And this is when they entered the study and going over time. So as you go left to right, it's over time. And then as up here is 100% of people leaving the hospital. So as time goes on, you see that in both groups, um, people are getting better. And there's some, there's a certain number of people in both groups that are getting well enough to leave the hospital. And that's what it means by this curve going up. But you can see the remdesivir group starts going up earlier and it separates from the placebo group and it stays separate from the placebo group towards the end here. Um, and, and if you look at people re receiving oxygen who have gotten better, if you look at that subgroup and over time, you see the placebo group getting better, but the remdesivir group getting better in larger proportion than the placebo group. Um, so one thing going back to that question, this isn't a cure, meaning um, in the sense that remdesivir doesn't cure COVID for everyone. I mean, the first thing is none of these curves around remdesivir go up to 100%. It's just better than the placebo. And, you know, that, that's a good thing, actually. I mean, even though something isn't necessarily a cure, at, at this point, we don't have anything that's been shown to have uh, significant benefit in terms of treatment, including hydroxychloroquine. So here we have a study based on double-blind placebo-controlled, um, randomized uh, study here that clearly shows a remdesivir is better. I mean, I wish it was much more better in terms of the separation, but it, it is better. And so, you know, that, that's a good thing to have. Any kind of incremental increase is a good thing in the field where we have no known treatments. Um, and, you know, by the way, it, you know, the president will obviously is going to get much easier and direct and faster access to these treatments. Uh, this is around and available in some hospitals, but it's, it's an expensive product to make and they're trying to make it as fast as possible. It's a complex product to make. And I just heard, um, and read that they, they have 50,000 doses nationwide right now. So, you know, based on the number of people that are getting it, and if those numbers go higher and we have increasing numbers of really sick people that get hospitalized with symptoms, we may get to the point where there's not enough for remdesivir to treat everybody. And so how do we, how do we allocate that or distribute that? That's always uh, an issue. So we really need to prevent people from getting it in the first place. So it's great to have, but it's not the end all and be all. These are two questions where I'm not really sure, it's related to remdesivir, but, um, but not really sure how to answer fully. I mean, the top one here is, is it true when the human body is fed, especially on a constant basis with externally manufactured antibodies, um, that it basically signals the body from making antibodies on its own. Like it receives a signal that these particular antibodies are not needed. Um, so if you're concerned about a, an approach like remdesivir, remdesivir is not going to be something that you get constantly. So um, it's a short, relatively short-term treatment, it's 10 days, and it's only for people that are actively sick with symptoms that are in a hospital. So, um, I mean, if I'm not really sure if there is a negative feedback mechanism for antibodies, and it may depend on what part of the antibodies. I, I mean, I'm not a full-blown immunologist in this regard, but the, your, your general concern in this question about antibodies preventing, if you, if you take a drug of antibodies, is it gonna keep your body from making antibodies? that's not going to be a concern because you're only going to be receiving, especially in the context of COVID, something like remdesivir for a relatively short period of time when you need all the antibodies you can get. And um, eventually your body will be able to make its own. The, bo the bottom question here is about, um, first of all, I, I don't know if the Regeneron antibodies last 
in the body for 12 months. Um, I don't know about that. Uh, so basically, would it conflict with the administration of a vaccine? So again, I think we're, we're talking about two separate situations here. You're, you're going to get the remdesivir treatment from Regeneron for a short period of time, only if you're acutely sick and you need an extra boost of those antibodies in the hospital with symptoms, especially pulmonary symptoms. Um, and the whole thing about a vaccine is, is really a much different time and place. You don't give a vaccine in somebody in that situation. Um, people who get infected will have for a, a brief period of time at least. And again, we have no idea how long the immunity lasts, but you're certainly not gonna be talking about vaccinating someone who recently had an infection. Um, so it will be sometime later, especially if they have negative antibodies, because we can, get testing for that, if you have negative antibodies to COVID, whether, um, you know, at that point, if there is a, a safe and effective vaccine out there, then there should be no issue with the Regeneron treatment if that person were to have gotten it in the past. So um, the Regeneron and getting antibodies is, is not really an issue. Some of you may have um, received as part of your lupus treatment, IVIG, it, it's not exactly the Regeneron approach, but it is one way of receiving pooled antibodies or immunoglobulins from other individuals. And we use that sometimes to treat certain aspects of the immune issues, the autoimmune issues in lupus and in other autoimmune conditions. So last question, um, now that the fall season is upon us and we're advised to get our flu shot, is there a pro or con to one taking the flu shot among this COVID-19 pandemic? Will the flu shot provide us better prevention from contracting the virus or become sicker? Um, is there a pro or con for one taking the flu shot? It, it's all pro um, in the sense that I mean, we're, we're encouraging very, it very much. And I encourage you um, to speak with your health professional. And if there's no other major reason, you know, short of uh, a, known, um, uh, a known response, uh, allergic response to the, the vaccine, and, and, and it's, it shouldn't be, oh, last time, you know, I got a flu shot once and then I got the flu. I encourage you, I hear that a lot, and I encourage you to talk to your, your doctor about that um, because flu shots are given during the cold season and, you know, it's not uncommon for people to get, you know, a cold or a bad cold and, and people misattribute that to the flu. Um, the flu shot isn't 100% perfect and maybe someone did get the flu um, at that time, but it doesn't mean that all future flu shots are just moot and worthless. The, the key thing during this pandemic going into this winter is that the flu is gonna go around also, and it's gonna start coming back. And the symptoms are very similar. So um, number one, it can be a bit confusing if, if, you, um, if you got flu symptoms and uh, we don't know whether it's the flu or, the, or, or, or COVID. And, one of the lessons also from last winter, or at least the early spring, when COVID was just starting to hit, or at least that we knew of, the US, that was the trail end of the flu season. And I remember very distinctly that we had people in the ICU, uh, at Grady anyway, and I know there are other places too that were infected with both viruses, both COVID and flu. And, and that's certainly gonna set you up with potentially more severe disease when you're talking about two different viruses. So um, we, we have a, a flu shot that is known to reduce the risk of getting flu. It would be wonderful to have that protection kind of minimize the chance of getting that. And you know, God forbid, if you were to get one or the other, or at least it, you're protected against somewhat more of the flu shot. Uh, the flu um, virus, and, and it would be much better to um, to have that. Now, there, there are a lot of individual issues. There's some medications that people are on with lupus that 
may minimize your response to flu shots like rituximab specifically, potentially Benlista or Belimumab. So these are all questions, again, that you should talk with your doctor very closely about. But I do encourage you in, in this fall and winter season, when you go to your primary care doctor and when you go to your rheumatologist, please ask about the flu shot. Um, ask whether you may be a good candidate. Think about it yourself. And if there are no strong reasons not to get it, um, please consider that. So thank you, Terry, um, and the Lupus Foundation of America Georgia chapter for all that you do. Uh, just finished the walk season, the virtual walk season. I know it was a very strange time for all of us, but uh, we're in spirit together. We're walking each and every day, and we encourage you to continue to interact with each other through the support groups virtually and all the other resources that the LFA um, Georgia has put together including the COVID resources that you can find on their website. And continue to send us your questions at this email address by 4 p.m. On, on the Sunday two weeks from, from now when we meet again. And we look forward to seeing you there. Until then, please be safe.